Carried. So now we're down to uh, Alec, Resource Recovery, number 14. Waiting patiently there. Uh, morning, everyone. I morning, mate. keep it uh, pretty brief. Um, I'll take the report as read. Um, obviously, this is the first format of this report we've given to you, so I'm happy to take questions and, and or any feedback on the, the information that we've provided, if you'd like to see it in a different form, or if there's other items that you would like to see reported. So, yeah, just over to you for questions. Okay. We have a question from Mark, and then me. Thank you. Um, I was wanting to point to the organics processing facility um, that's currently in the consent stages out in Hornby. Um, I was just wondering if you could perhaps give a more in-depth update to the council as to where that's at at the moment in regards to its progress. Yep. So the eco gas application obviously went in, and um, you were talking earlier on about the you know the complexities of consents and stuff. So the current position is is um, they put two applications in. The council application has been granted. That normally um, refers to the land use, transport implications, things like that. So that that was issued. Uh, so they have that. They've received. Um, they're in an information exchange phase with um, ECAN, and we've got a date, a provisional date of the end of um, November for the applicant to respond to those questions. There's nothing untoward about that. It's basically. Um, an information gathering exercise. So obviously, you can have the consent assessed. They call on any relevant expertise or external advice that they need, and then they go back to the applicant with any questions just for clarity. So that's the stage we're at. So our anticipation on a project timeline is that they've got until February next year before we would see the project timeline start to shift out. So at this moment, we don't anticipate any change in the project <coughs> deliverables. Um, the applicant has started to our eco gas have started to um, work towards the construction process and they're starting to put tenders out for civils and stuff. There'll be different packages for construction. Um, so, so they're obviously continuing with parallel work streams as well. Um, so that, that probably summarises where eco gas is at. At Hornby, uh, uh, sorry, at, at um, Bromley, we had the latest um, community group meeting last night. Um, so obviously the, the community is keen to see the project keep going, be on track, and then for us to exit the site as anticipated in December 26. Um, just to sort of follow up on that, I'd heard a, a noise from a, a, another source that potentially the um, resource consent was on hold um, due to a landowner's non-approval or something which I thought was a bit unusual. Is there any noise around anything like that? Yeah, my, my understanding of that is it, it's it's just a technical matter between the parties. There's nothing um, untoward about it. It's basically a, a, a relationship, transactional relationship between EcoGas, the, the previous property owner, and, and just getting that paperwork aligned so that it satisfies the requirements for ECAN. So we don't anticipate that being an issue. Um, and I think that will be addressed with the information exchange towards the end of this month. And I guess one last question. Um, through our meetings we have on a regular basis, um, you've mentioned that you've got a technical advisory group involved um, with it, I guess. Can yeah. you enlighten us on that? Yeah, we do. We, we've, we've followed a similar format to what Auckland Council did when they built the plant in Reparoa. So we have a technical advisory group. Um, so parties to that are obviously EcoGas, they're technical advisors. Um, and we are there as council, as staff, and we've got te technical advice. Um, we're actually using Becca. Um, so effectively what happens is the, the design is broken down into component parts. They come to the technical advisory group for, for critique and, and um, uh, assessment. And um, we basically, the, the purpose of that exercise is to add value to the design and just make sure that any uh, potential contingency or any improvements are, are considered now rather than retrospectively in response to an issue. So we're trying to just get the design as, as the, to the best level it can be before it's actually constructed. Thank you. Pauline? Thank you. Um, just on page 147, when you talk about the um, packaging forum commencing this uh, trial for to divert um, plastic and metal lids from, from the landfill, 
Um, so, and I know there's quite a few um, community centres um, around St Albans area and Richmond that are doing this, um, probably around Christchurch as well, I'm not sure. Where do they go? Do, do we pick them up from there or what happens to them? Yeah, so those, the packaging forum run a couple of schemes. They've got the soft plastic one at the supermarkets predominantly and they've got this bottle and cap um, programme. So effectively they've got um, a recycler, they return that. So they run the collection system, the supplying of the boxes. Yeah. What they've said to us is we've approached them and said, do you want to make this more widespread? But they've said at the moment, can we just trial it and, and, and prove the concept effectively? So they've got a number of sites around the country and then once they're confident in their logistics um, and their end market, then they'll, they'll, they'll lift the scale. Yeah, but where, where do they go to? They'll go, well, there's various plastic manufacturers. The, the, the material is recyclable. Yeah. The problem it was it causing was in the material recovery facilities. It was jamming in equipment and causing yeah. blockages and stuff. Mm -hmm. So there's a number of um, recyclers, both onshore and offshore, that can take that material. Okay, and then later on you talk about, um, you know, the feedback from the public was wanting more education programmes to support, you know, waste reduction. Do we support these community groups and centres that are actually running these collection points? Do we support them with education programmes? We do. The, the education programme covers um, one part of council deals with the schools and, and you know, wetland restoration, all that sort of, you know, the activity based stuff for the education side. But we've got an extensive programme for the public. A lot of it is slanted towards them engaging with the systems we provide in the right manner to reduce um, um, the potential for contamination. But we also have programmes that promote all the schemes that encourage reduction. Um, and a lot of that information is on the council website. Um, there's more we could do, but, but again, it's trying to um, work out what that involvement could be with those groups. So we've um, just employed a new uh, waste minimisation advisor. So we're, we're kind of changing the approach that um, that, that person will take um, so that they are more connected to the, community, the yeah. things that we are seeing within the service delivery, but also the needs in the community as well. So we're more tailoring the education programmes to what the problems actually yeah. are out there. Yeah. yeah, it needs people, doesn't it? It's a bit like um, <clears throat> cleaning up our stormwater. We've got to stop yeah. the pollution at yeah. source. And same with the um, <clears throat> recycling. And one more question. If I may, on page 153, we talk about the closed landfills. Um, <clears throat> so we're using consultants to um, investigate improving water quality in Bexley, Lake, uh, slope stabilisation in Onuku, and rock revealed on oh, Dunbarry's Bay, and also uh, contamination of water in Horseshoe Lake. So, do we not have the skills in house to do that work, or is it a specialised short term kind of project? Do we need consultants for that? Yeah, we, we've got some internal skill sets. So, we've got um, the technical services uh, department can help us once we know what the the project might be or the physical construction work, so they can help us on that side. We've got some um, skill set and advice we could draw from the likes of the Three Waters team, you know, because they're obviously involved in that. But generally, the the, the type of work that's been done is the the production of the the plan or the report that then would go to ECAN to be assessed as, as fit for purpose. So that's where we'll bring in the, the te technical expertise. So there's a sort of a it's not coming directly from us, it's coming from a recognised expert, if you like. So we're not using consultants to do the everyday stuff. Um, that's A lot of that's done by our team. Grant is effectively the, the main contact there that will physically manage the landfill portfolio and then he'll call on the relevant expertise as and when he needs it. But we do need to use external consultants to a, a limited extent to give us technical advice. OK, thank you. I'm happy to move it, by the way. Yeah, yeah. Sarah, please. <coughs> Thanks so much, um, and I'm happy to second, but um, there was some uh, research undertaken recently by the El Pawaho Heathcote River Network um, for the Community Waterways Partnership on the use of um, wheelie bin latches, um, and they were enormously successful in um, stopping the lids opening when the, they were, the bins were sort of blown or knocked over. Um, which of course creates a lot of litter and stuff and gets blown into our rivers and things. Have we investigated being able to offer the bin um, latches at all in higher risk areas such as on the hills and those kind of things to keep that amount of litter and stuff down? 
Yeah, so council supported that trial and that, that investigative uh, uh, piece of work. Um, the report only came in this week, so we're yeah. anticipating bringing that back to you at the March meeting. I think it's the 5th of March. So we'll we'll analyse the report and then we'll give you a, an objective view on what the report's telling us and, and um, what the recommendations could be going forward. So there's no decision process gone through yet. Um, we don't have a definitive. I mean, what I could say is that to put that across the whole system, carries a certain number, so there's, there's somewhere in between. So the latches effectively are um, displayed to the public at the moment on the website to the manufacturer that makes them, and you can go and buy them on a user pays basis. But it's whether we want to modify that approach, but we need to get the paper to you in March just with those recommendations. Okay, and will that come with some information, not just from this research, but... Um, so how other centres are using them, those kind of things, because some of the other cities use them. And, yeah, yeah, I mean, those, those devices are, are widespread in use across other TAs, so yeah, we can yeah. take that into account as well. Yeah. be great, thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Um, thanks, Alec. Uh, great report, and really enjoy seeing the uh, curbside collection <coughs> stats. It looks like we have some 500,000 bins in service, is that about right? <laughs> Sorry, what was the question there about bins and service? Do we have about 500,000 bins? Yeah, in, yeah it's in, in the range of 550,000, yeah. Yeah, so do you have any idea how much those clips uh, Sarah was talking about is? Because um, this has come up Yeah, um, they, they range, if you buy them individually, it can be around $15. If you buy them on mass bulk, you can drive the price down to as low as maybe $3. So, you yeah. know, the more you buy, the, the cheaper they become. But it, that's yeah. still, you know, potentially $1.5 million across the... The system. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's the thing we've just got to watch. So there'll be different ways to achieve yeah. the same outcome. You've also got to you've got to reveal to you the, the the extent the survey covered and what 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 um, what was the 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 the, the scale of people that it, it took into account. Yeah. So it, it's it, in principle, yes, the latches can be made more readily available, but mm. we just need to give you the relevant advice as to the consequence yeah. of that. Yeah. So um, just uh, again around the bin stats, I mean, um, a huge number of collections made, but only a few missed. Um, so when a bin is missed, uh, it, does that number, say for red bins, 407 were, uh, no, 315 were missed in September, is that uh, reported to us? Um, or is there some, some sort of tracking system that that's, tells us we missed a bin? Yeah, yes, well, there the contract is. Um, there's a couple of things happen. The, the, the trucks are capable of taking a photograph as they go past a certain address. Oh, okay. So in theory, if it was obvious what the address was, then they could see we were there at 10 o'clock, the bin wasn't out, and we moved on. Wow. It does get more complicated where you come to multiple units where there could be five or six bins coming down the mm. one side lane. But there is a system there to, if you like, identify to us um, and, and to, to the management and the contractor side wh where the truck was at any given <coughs> time and, and what the streetscape looked like. Yeah. Um, but we do receive um, follow-up calls from the public, yeah. um, so they're probably tracking around about three or 4,000 a month of all um, tickets that come into the system and, and um, you know, probably about Somewhere about half of them are probably related to misspins or damage spins. Mm, yeah. So they're the two main components. But there's there's a list of about 30 different events that could occur that the public might report to us. But misspins and damage spins are probably the two highest occurring themes. Yeah, and just to be clear, because uh, I've had a few queries about this, when a bin goes missing, they people have to report it to us within 48 hours, otherwise they um, are required to pay a fee. To um, um, just in terms, so who who actually owns the bins? Do we own the bins, or do the? Um so at this moment in time, the bins are owned okay. and supplied by the contractor. We okay. have a, a buyback mechanism at the end of the contract. Yeah. In terms of responsibility, we assign the bin to the property. So mm -hmm. if you yeah. move from the property, the bin should stay. So really, the, the individual responsibility is placed on the occupant of that property at the given time to put the bin out and take it back. Yeah, um, we might it, take the rest of this offline, but thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Appreciate the 48 hour thing was changed uh, in the waste by law. It used to be 24 hours. Um, but yeah, we, we, we're aware of the ongoing conversation, so, so happy to yeah, continue that. Thank you, Kelly. Yeah. Aaron? Yeah, I just got a question around page 153, the closed landfills. 
Um, it's great that we'll be replanting, but is that plastic plant covers we're using? Um, I think it's the, I'd be right in saying it's the cost look material, you know, the, the same sort of stuff that the signage is made for the um, for right. sale signs. So, because when you get storms and that, some of the stuff blows away and um, ends up in the waterways. Is it biodegradable? I doubt it is. I don't think so, no. Because no. I thought we switched, when I raised this a few years ago, to cardboard. Did that not work? I, I can find out from the mm. um, the, the technical vision as to what, cool. what material it is and, and, and if that's been taken into consideration. But the material there looks like standard cost work. Cool. Mark, please. Thank you. Um, just picking up on the recycling on page 149, uh, where it mentions that glass is sent to for recycling. Can you remind us, is that sent to actual glass recycling or is that still sent to um, the roading contractors for putting in, in roads? So the, the current system is, um, there's two systems within that, that are influenced by, um, are under council's influence. Um, one is the, the glass that comes out of the material recovery facility is um, screen graded, sized, um, and then it's, it's sent to the... Um, the roading sector and it becomes a, a substitute aggregate and then we're also working with um, a, a private company um, on a sort of separate uh, source so the public can actually separate the colour of the bottles and jars at the transfer station um, and that, that second scheme produces about 500 tonnes a year and the other scheme produces between seven and a half and eight thousand tonnes a year. And is there any um, ability for us as a council to move towards um, yeah, so we've fishing. actually got a request for information out just now on the GET system, and really what we're trying to do there is is get the market the market to contribute to the thinking on what the future of glass would look like, and and whether it was glass out, glass in, separated, um, um, mixing a bin, all the different. So we're, we're, that that closes on the fourth of December. We're just and that'll help inform our thinking for the future procurement. Okay, thank thank you, Alec. Um, we're going to be here all day. If we're, I'm sorry, Yana, we're not going to let that question. If you want to put it through the OC, that'd be good. We have a mover uh, and seconder. Second. Yep. Oh, no debate. All those in favour? Aye. The gates. Thank you. That's carried. I've got to get out of here at half past one. Right. <laughs> now, this is.